This episode, I'm joined by Kevin Carson, who is an American social theorist, self-proclaimed economist, and anarchist without adjectives. In this episode, we discuss his book, The Desktop Regulatory State, alongside discussions on capitalism, post-capitalism, anarchism, hierarchy, and organisation. I'd like to say a big thank you to all my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible, and if you would like to support Mythic's podcast, or become part of the community, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Okay, so Kevin Carson, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics podcast. Great, uh, thanks for having me. We are going to be discussing, amongst probably other things, because this book really is almost encyclopedic in its knowledge, but it's uh, your latest book, but I do believe you have one coming out very soon. So I believe uh, The Desktop Regulatory State, Countervailing Power of Individuals and Networks, uh, is this your latest book? Uh, it's the latest one published. I've got one that's uh, Capitalist nursery, about uh, nursery ready fables. for publication, just uh, waiting to uh, have a friend format the uh, PDF to upload. Ah, I see, I see. Um, so all of your books, as I understand it, sort of influence one another, and it's sort of a... You know, starting from studies in studies in mutualist political economy all the way through to these later works, they all sort of influence each other, and it's sort of a, a progression of thought. There, would you say? Yeah, it's a, sort of a chain reaction. Uh, every book uh, I've written since mutualist political economy has uh, been uh, ex- an expansion on one of the subtopics in a previous book. Uh, that I only had space to deal with briefly, but was uh, intrigued by and wanted to dig more deeply into. Um, so, for those who don't know your work, um, could you could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is what it is you do? Uh, well, uh, I'm an anarchist. Uh, work as a uh, freelance writer. Uh, churn out a book every few years and do an occasional article and uh, live off uh, uh, some small book royalties and Patreon income. Uh, I write uh, commentary and research papers at Center for a Stateless Society. Um and uh, as far as my anarchism goes, I'm sort of an anarchist without adjectives. I originally came from uh, a background of uh, individualist anarchism on the the model of uh, Benjamin Tucker, uh, Thomas Hodgkin, and so forth, which was a, a sort of uh, market form of libertarian socialism. And uh, right now, I guess my biggest influences would be autonomism and uh, the new municipalist movements in places like Barcelona and Jackson, Mississippi. And I'm really interested in things involving post-capitalist transition and uh, the, the things going on in our present day society that amount to seeds or building blocks of a future society. I'm really, uh, really into interstitial and gradualist, uh, trans transition models. Okay. Okay. I've certainly got, uh, one question for you there with, uh, with regard to the idea of post-capitalism, but, be- but before we sort of jump into the, uh, the meat of this interview, I like to get the hermetics question out at the start here. So you said to me before we started that this is one that you sort of struggled with. Um, so I'm intrigued to see who you picked. Uh, you can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who would you pick? Well, I suppose uh, it would be um, David Graeber, uh, who's unfortunately just recently dead. Um uh, Pyotr Kropotkin and uh, Eleanor Ostrom, because they're all thinkers, I think, who would find areas of, of commonality and, and ways their their thought uh, 
complements each other when it comes to the importance of horizontal communications and uh, and the ways that power relations distort information or, or create conflicts of interest. Do you think there might be any conflicts in, in that room, even though that they're so alike? Uh, well, Ostrom would probably be the most... Uh, I hate, hate to tar her with the word, but uh, neoliberal in the <laughs> in the group, and that she would be the one most inclined to integrate her insights into the existing system, and that she would view the class or power analysis of Graeber and Kropotkin as being. Uh, I guess I think she's actually used the the term conspiracy theory uh, in response to. To people who analyze the neoliberal effects of World Bank policy and that sort of thing. Hmm. Okay, okay. Well, maybe maybe some of those thinkers will come back in later on. But I do just want to jump back to something you said with regard to you know you're interested in post capitalist transition. So are you someone who truly believes that there there can actually be something which is uh, should we say beyond or as you said post capitalism that it that there be something which isn't intrinsically tethered to capitalism, which seems to be the, the reality at the moment that anything try, that tries to break away simply gets sort of uh, mutated back into capitalism in some other form. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm thinking of the, uh, you know, the primary characteristic of capitalism being rent extraction, which depends on a lot of things like artificial property rights and Enclosed land and natural resources, uh, artificial scarcities of information through intellectual property, and so forth. Uh, and I, th- I think we're on the, and it also depends on massive levels of state intervention to guarantee outlets for surplus capital and uh, idle production capacity. Uh, and I think we're headed in a direction where all those things become unsustainable and the system is going to have to completely regroup and reconfigure itself on a less extractive and more intensive level to make uh, more efficient use of resources and and be less dependent on artificial property rights enforcement and on Subsidized you know, on the addition of uh, subsidized inputs. So you you believe that when capitalism comes sort of finally comes face to face with uh, you know, re- resource limits and the sustainability problem, that's when uh, those who wish to move beyond capitalism could find a find a way in to do that. Yeah, and I think as it's going through that process. Right now, you know, with things like, uh, you know, the chronic tendency towards uh, underemployment, uh, declining rate of of profit and, and all those things. And we have rising levels of precarity and underemployment. I think people are gradually turning to the building blocks of the future just for survival because all of these terminal crises of capitalism coincide with a lot of promising developments in technology like uh, cheap open source micro manufacturing tools uh, various institutions for sharing cost and risk and and mutual aid within the social economy um, I think it was uh, James O'Connor in uh, accumulation crisis who said that it's a uh, a recurring phenomenon that during economic down downturns and large scale unemployment, the working class turns of out of necessity to direct production for use within the social economy and shifts the meeting of of its needs, at least in part, from wage labor to uh, self production within the household and social economy. And for the last 20 years, we've been in a process where instead of it being a cyclical downturn, we're in a downturn, we're in a long term, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, a permanent uh, long long term decline in employment.
employment hours and levels of employment. So there's a long-term tendency towards meeting needs outside the wage system and and finding ways uh, of supporting each other through mutual aid instead. The there's uh, a certain amount of culture lag and uh, inertia involved in the tools that are available actually being taken up and, and um one of the things that over, helps to overcome that, that culture lag, overcome that inertia, is just the pressure for survival. So um, it's, it's, it's been technically feasible to shift a major share of production, if not the majority of, of production, to the social economy and to relocalized industry and horticulture. But it hasn't, it hasn't happened just because of uh, the culture cultural inertia entailed in, in the old system and survival is becoming the killer app that will drive adoption i think that's interesting because i understand that you um you utilize austrian economics in your work a fair bit um uh, mm, uh, no not really i mean i in in mutualist political economy i uh I think I framed uh, some of the arguments in uh, Austrian terms just to because I was uh, attempting to persuade right libertarians to a, a left wing perspective. But uh, and I, I used the uh, Austrian concept of uh, disutility of, of labor uh, in part in justifying a, a labor theory of value. But other than that, I've I've never really identified with Austrianism or considered it a major component of my thought. Okay, okay. Because what I was going to say is um, I've recently been reading Karl Menger, and he he outlines that, you know, man's needs in relation to survival is, is the, you know, is always going to be that top priority. And I was wondering, you know, in terms of what you were saying there about on a local level, beginning to understand that actually all these needs which capitalism is sort of artificially creating – we're beginning to to have this need to survive again, which is sort of the uh, I guess in the way Menger outlines it, it's an Austrian position, but I guess it could be seen uh, as a general position from many other points of view. Yeah, I, I'd say uh, I don't really see that as uh, uniquely Austrian, although if it it coincides with uh, something that Austrians are saying, that's uh, great. There's a question I was going to ask you much later on, but as you brought up the the sustainability angle with respect to capitalism and, you know, resource limitations and scarcity. Uh, you do bring up John Michael Greer's theory of catabolic collapse in uh, the desktop regulatory state, and you're quite critical of it. So what are your main criticisms here? Because I'm uh, I'm a big fan of Greer's. I've had him on the show quite a lot. Um, so I'm interested to hear the other side here. Well, the main problem, I think, is that he doesn't take into account the possibility of ephemeralization. And yet he's correct that there's a a huge amount of uh, past labor and capital sunk in these very thick capital-intensive infrastructures uh, that could not be replaced on the same scale. But I think uh, the fact that these are, you know, to some extent stranded uh, Elephant carcasses doesn't uh, doesn't really hamper the potential for the future that much because we're shifting to technological models based on much more ephemeral, less uh, uh, material intensive forms of production that rely much more on light distributed infrastructures. So the um, amount of material inputs required for the dominant infrastructures and for the kinds of actual production that go on at the nodes of the infrastructure are up to an order of magnitude lower. We've, you know, to put it in science fiction terms, we're undergoing the the collapse of the Western Roman Empire, but this time we've got uh, you know Star Trek matter energy replicators in the in the villages so the old aqueducts and highways don't really make that much difference to us okay. and uh, he he raised the objection to this that uh, the inter- internet infrastructure um, 
required to support the new decentralized system required massive energy inputs but i uh, i don't i don't have the the sources to hand but i know his, that particular argument of his was pretty uh, effectively demolished by someone who compared his claims to the actual energy inputs required by internet servers uh, and found that it's a there is in fact a huge energy savings overall in shifting functions wherever feasible from meat space to networked communication okay so you you do think it's just do you think there's some sort of um, maybe romanticism on the part of Greer there I'm not sure uh, I've never I've never really um, identified that much with the whole neo-primitivist uh, viewpoint, uh, although I, I do uh, see in some ways the, the model of uh, post-capitalism I'm envisioning, envisioning as uh, a way of achieving neo-primitivist ends with high-tech means. I think it involves the future uh, post-capitalist society will be much more high-tech and post-scarcity, but it will also be, it will also uh, occupy a much smaller ecological footprint. Okay, so that's sort of, that seems to be a bit of a paradox, but so I guess on the primitive level, that's more to do with the the carbon output as opposed to a lifestyle. Yeah. Okay, okay. So you're not in any way uh, sympathetic to the, the primitive lifestyle of like John Zerzan or people along the, along those lines. No, um, <laughs> I, I do think uh, Greer and the uh, other collapsitarians are uh, correct about the crisis tendencies within capitalism, the things that are leading to decay. I just think there's a lot more potential uh, for a for a uh, higher tech and uh, less material intensive system to emerge from the uh, interstices of the old dying system. What? Uh, just to get to a practical question, then I guess I, I would ask for for the sake of those uh, those practical anarchists listening, what needs to be done for such a transition to come about? Have you sort of formulated some practical steps for that? Well, that is. Uh, more or less the topic of my forthcoming book, Exodus. Uh, the uh, main point of the book is uh, a critique of the old old left organizational models based on organizational mass and hierarchy uh, and their strategy focused on large-scale action to seize control of the state or the commanding heights of the means of production, you know, whether uh, whether through uh, syndicalist labor unions or social democratic political parties or vanguard political parties or whatever. Uh, the argument is that all of those strategies are, are outmoded because the large-scale institutions of, of state and corporation are themselves becoming obsolete and uh, all the building blocks of the future of society are things that can be developed at relatively low cost on a small scale within the interstices of the dying capitalist system. And so, you know, the strategy we should pursue is just to more of what's already happening in terms of what you know what people in in places like uh, Barcelona or the uh, cooperation Jackson movement or the the evergreen cooperative movement in Cleveland and so forth or are doing community land trusts uh, cooperatives uh, uh, you know municipal broadband uh, stakeholder cooperative, platforms for the sharing economy uh, that minor micro manufacturing uh, facilities and 
and social institutions for for sharing and mutual aid and uh, distributing risks and costs among local populations. And as as far as political action goes, our primary focus should just be on harm reduction or damage mitigation, creating the most favorable background environment politically that we can for this this process of, of building the new society within the shell of the old, but not using not using politics as the primary driver for actually building the new society where the the point of politics is just to create the most uh, favorable battlefield and if that means voting the lesser evil or building political alliances of of convenience in order to have people in the government that are running political cover for us to some extent that's that's fine do you, do you not think there's some risk there for in in the way that if you're recovering, or if you're, should we say, building the new societies, you say, from the sort of the relics or the ashes of capitalism, uh, do you not think there's sort of a danger in recontextualizing those bits that you're taking from capitalism in that it might, you know, spring up again in some other form? It might seem that I'm repeating myself here, but uh, I'm, uh, I guess I'm on the pessimistic end of, of uh, the, the end of capitalism scale, I guess. You. You're talking about uh, what capitalism? Uh, well, you, you co-opting these efforts? Yeah, uh, I think if you're if you're utilizing the, should we say, not the structures, but should we say, innovative efforts that have been built within and from capitalism. If you're sort of taking ideas, or even you know, you could bring it down to the even the concept of machines from these ashes of capitalism. Isn't there a danger that from this uh, it could spring up again? Uh, I, I don't really think so. I don't, uh, for, for one thing, uh, capitalism, uh, and in terms of technological history, has chosen among uh, various alternative technologies based on its own needs and distorted the path of development to uh, a consi- uh, considerable extent in suboptimal ways. Uh, I'm a big fan of technological history historians like Lewis Mumford, who's, who who uh, argued that uh, the second industrial revolution uh, that integrated electrical power into industry in the late 19th century, uh, he argued that its ideal form was decentralized with the uh, production facilities located close to the point of consumption rather than in centralized locations and dependent on long-distance transportation. And for a long time, capitalism has distorted uh, that potential and instead integrated electrical power in suboptimal ways that didn't take uh, the best advantage of the new technologies. So to the extent that we're using technologies that were developed under capitalism, we're returning to the path that capitalism uh, left untrod. And we're doing what should have been done starting 150 years ago. So what what are the two directions there? You know, what's the one that capitalism took? And so what is it? Why did capitalism develop the way it did? What was it trying to retain? Profit or? Yeah, uh, basically it was an alliance between, it, it's uh, pretty much the same thing that happened with the first industrial revolution. The uh, technologies of steam power, uh, uh, coal as an energy source, uh, and so on were adopted by a cluster of class interests that included that included the absolute states of the early modern period, uh, the large scale landed oligarchies that had enclosed the commons, uh, military industry, uh, mining industry, 
and so on. And uh, they promoted technologies in particular that were most suited to the extractive needs of that uh, constellation of classes and diverted the potential of of, uh, technological development from other more optimal paths in order to maximize possibility of extraction. It's... uh, I think it's related to what James Scott talked about with legibility. Uh, capitalism doesn't maximize any anything like a generic form of efficiency or productivity. What it maximizes is ease of extraction. So if that means choosing a less technically optimal or less efficient form of production because it's easier to skim rents off the top. That's what capitalism will do. And in the case of the second industrial revolution, we already had all of these path dependencies and uh, cultural inertia built in where uh, the new decentralized electric electrical machinery was incorporated into that pre-existing uh, centralized institutional structure and and developed along the same centralized path. Uh, Lewis Mumford called it um, cultural um, pseudomorph. Uh, like uh, he was making an analogy in, from geology uh, with the fossilization process where a dead uh, animal or, or plant is, uh, is buried and uh, the old organic material progressively decays and is swept away, but the the new minerals are, are brought in and, and uh, fill in the vacancy so that they're uh, they repli- replicate the original shape of the, the decayed organism with completely new material. And he argued that's what happened with. Uh, Industrial capitalism in the 20th century, it uh, it more or less put new wines in in old bottles, and uh, ad- it subverted the uh, the potential of all of these new technologies, and instead incorporated them into an old institutional framework. And we're reaching the point where these new decentralized technologies are so efficient uh, that they're efficient beyond capitalism's capability of enclosing them for rent extraction anymore. They're, they finally reach the level of productivity where, where capitalism can no longer enclose them within the old institutional framework. Uh, the Just the levels of surplus capital and uh, excessive production capacity and uh, idle labor that are being created or beyond capitalism's ability to cope with. Do you consider centralization and, you know, hierarchical organization sort of one and the same token in terms of control? Uh, pretty much. I mean, I, I suppose uh, centralization is possible on a, on a horizontal basis, but for the most part, hierarchy and centralization seem to coincide. You consider all hierarchies pretty much stupid, though, right? Systematically stupid. Yes, ab- absolutely. Uh, what uh, hierarchies do is, is basically uh, make honest or accurate communication impossible and, and distort information flow by by creating conflicts of interest between the the people at the bottom that are in direct conflict with the uh, that are in direct contact with the immediate situation, and the people at the top who are making policies to govern the situation, and the same the same conflicts of interest um, create in, incentives for the people at the bottom to hoard their information to keep as much secret as possible from the people at the top and to economize on their own effort and do the bare minimum possible because they know that any information they contribute to increasing the efficiency of production 
will be used against them that whatever 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 increased uh, productivity occurs will be expropriated by the people at the top instead of internalized by the people who come up with the ideas for increasing productivity so really in trying to in trying to get rid of hierarchical organizations towards decentralized ones uh, or at least being critical of them you're trying to would you would you agree that you're trying to uh, you know get rid of opposition of interest entirely yeah i think power by its very nature creates conflict of interest uh, because the whole purpose of, of power is to extract rent it's to enable the people who possess power to benefit at the expense of those who don't have power uh, otherwise otherwise there would be no need for that kind of oppositional power uh, and if you take the power away you wind up with a system where the people who have the actual knowledge are making the decisions and the people who contribute the knowledge and do the work fully internalize the benefits of their knowledge. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you consider knowledge a commodity in that sense? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Do you, do you consider knowledge uh, a commodity in that sense? I'm not sure. Uh, not sure I... Uh, Follow that. Okay. I mean, I think of, of knowledge as a uh, as a function of, of communication. Um, well, what I, what it's I, it's it's something. It's it's something of knowledge is something of value in order to achieve optimal results. Uh, when I, I hear commodity, you know, I think of uh, something being uh, sold on the on the market. It's 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 a uh, it's a systemic function that doesn't operate on an optimal level when power is present. Well, I was just thinking about conflict Conflict of interest is generally, you know, where, where both, both parties want some end, but one party's, you know, either created a monopoly or, or alienated the other members from it. So usually the way to... Uh, uh, would, would I be on the right track there or not? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Uh, if you look at um, 20th century industrial history... Uh, Taylorism and other forms of scientific management, the, the central strategy of, of management has been to render production processes more legible from above, uh, to de-skill labor, and to eliminate whatever uh, monopoly that production workers have over knowledge of the work process and all the different forms of, of of tacit knowledge that are that are hard to summarize and transmit from one person to another uh, and replace it with knowledge that can be easily accessed by managerial hierarchies instead. So you don't think that removing a conflict of interest would be reliant on some sort of form of post scarcity where there's an absolute abundance so we don't actually have to have the conflict or is that what this decentralized form of production would eventually lead towards in your opinion yeah um i'm not i'm not sure that uh i i, I see post scarcity uh more in terms of uh eliminating the uh, need to commodify consumption goods uh, or to use markets as uh, an allocation mechanism but in terms of conflicts of 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 interest um in terms of, of governance i think uh eliminating or reducing conflicts of interest has always been a a possibility even uh at higher levels of scarcity there were there was a lot less conflict of interest in an open field medieval village where every household had a certain number of furlong strips in the different fields and nobody was forced to work at wage, at wage labor for anyone else than there was uh, after the commons were enclosed and uh, agricultural 
laborers worked for wages for a capitalist farmer. Uh, I think in in any case, uh, regardless of the level of output or the level of scarcity, any time that you put decision-making power in the hands of the people who possess the knowledge and you allow the people who do the production to fully internalize the benefits of it, you're reducing the conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. And what happens What happens in that situation? What happens to those who you know, previously were abusing the conflict of interest? I guess in that situation it would be you know, the, uh, the kings or the queens. Uh, I guess they uh, have to look for something to do. <laughs> Till the fields. Yeah, or uh, or at least the level of extraction goes way down. Um, I think it was uh, in Chesterton's History of England, he said that before um, the ex- uh, that uh, at the height of, of uh, feudalism, before the enclosures, uh, and before what he called the rebellion of the rich, uh, from Henry the Eighth on, uh, a typical manor house was just a, a slightly larger, glorified uh, peasant cottage, and the uh, kings and dukes uh, lived in what were just glorified manor houses. Uh, the system was much less extractive and much less hierarchical. So um, I think it's uh, partly a matter of degree as uh, we as we go through the, the decline of capitalism today, I think there will be, you know, some survival of, of uh, corporations and states into the indefinite future, but they will take on less extractive and less hierarchical characteristics over time. So really, when, when yeah. once the hierarchical organization is introduced, what you're actually introducing is a, sort of a tyrannical form of power. Yeah. Well, uh, tyrannical power, uh, I'm not sure if that's uh, redundant or not. Um, <laughs> I, so for, I for, guess... For, it, for you... I guess, you oh, know, sorry. in some... Uh, the co- I guess you could, uh, in theory, just refer to any coordination function as power, but I don't really think of it as power because, you know, when I think of power, uh, it entails opposition and uh, the ability to impose one's will on uh, another unwilling party. So to that ex- to that extent, uh, power is by definition tyrannical and it uh, involves uh conflict of interest where one party benefits at the expense of the other so what what would be perhaps this is a bit of a vague question and what is your sort of equivalent for power in the system that you'd like to see that would still get things done because uh i'm not sure without you know i'll just play devil devil's advocate i'm not sure without that competitive status-based dynamic which i would see as sort of natural to humans which is inclusive of power I'm not sure how much would would get done. Well, I mean, we uh, I'd say just being able to live comfortably and uh, get more consumption goods for the same amount of labor or for less labor is a pretty strong incentive to do things as efficiently as as possible. If uh, people producing to meet their own needs don't uh, have an incentive on that basis to cooperate as effectively as possible and do things as efficiently as possible just for their own welfare. Uh, it's a pretty sorry reflection on humanity. I, I think I, if I believed that, I would just uh, stop bothering to write about any of this stuff. <laughs> okay. So you... It's, it, because the alternative is that... Uh, People are, is to believe that people are too stupid to know their own interests and too short-sighted to be able to cooperate for their common long-term good without someone standing over them with a whip driving them like animals. So, so perhaps this is sort of almost the 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 undergraduate question. Um, so you know, 
I will admit to my seeming very silly here, but in this decentralized future society, what is to to stop someone, you know, within this cooperative society, what is to stop someone forming a monopoly or, or beginning to to take take charge or, or be competitive in some manner? Well, they have to be able to do it for, for one thing. Uh, just wanting to do it isn't enough. You've got to have a majority of people that are willing to give you that power and uh, to enforce a, a monopoly, you've got to be able to actually prevent anyone else from doing whatever it is you want to do and uh, I think that's becoming a lot less a lot less feasible one thing one thing I would like to bring in because I was really happy to to see it in the book is um well him in the book it's the work of Ivan Ivan Illich um who I don't think many people really appreciate anymore so it was, I was sort of happy to see um I believe it's tools of uh, conviviality that you reference Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, Illich. So, in, yeah. In what sense has he sort of, uh, inf- you know, influenced your vision there of the future? And what I think specifically as well, tools of conviviality is, 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 um, you know, in relation to what we've been talking about. I think it's it's fairly relevant. Well, uh, I think uh, one of the central uh, things entailed in conviviality is. Uh, Autonomy and secure control over the things affecting your day-to-day life, not not being dependent on external centers of power for your basic needs and having day-to-day control over the direction of the ways that you meet your needs and uh, the kind of future society I'm envisioning, uh, that's very much a part of it, decentralization of, of production and consumption to levels of uh, organization that are under the direct control of the people affected by them. Um, we're talking in, in terms of production technology, we're talking about a shift to small scale production using high tech, high tech craft tools of the sort that uh, Illich would consider convivial. Uh, we're talking about virtually every aspect of production and coordination being done on a scale that's uh, integrated into the needs of daily life by ordinary people rather than rather than people being subordinated to the needs of the technology and that was probably the central defining characteristic of uh, conviviality for Illich. Mm-hmm. So, uh, sort of, people mm-hmm. having people having autonomy and people being uh, treated as ends rather than means. So, sort of in a fairly simplistic way, that you know, the ability to get a have a three D printer is almost sort of neo Illichian. Yeah, and. Uh, the networked uh, communication and, and horizontal organization as well. I remember, I, th- I think it was in de-schooling society, he envisioned some sort of community center where they had things like uh, tape-recorded lectures uh, uh, and telephone trees where people interested in a certain subject could uh, connect with a debate uh, database of uh, experts or, or teachers who wanted to, to teach them. And uh, the Internet is uh, sort of a much higher tech way of, of uh, achieving that end, higher tech version of the same thing. One, one thing I would like to ask you just with regards to what you were saying right at the beginning about, you know, what you do for a living, it seems that you're really trying to live by your by your principles. Do you feel that you're sort of living as close to your political principles as you as you could? I'm not uh, I'm not sure. I mean to a certain extent, uh it's I'd say it's luck and privilege to be able to do this. And you know the old the old saying there's no ethical consumption under capitalism, but to the extent that I'm able to make choices, I do what I can to minimize my dependence uh, and reduce my reliance on outside income streams and to increase my resilience against outside income shocks. Uh, 
and I'm certainly uh, I'm certainly dependent on the goodwill and support of the people who who read my work. Other than that, I you know I keep trying to get closer. Uh, every bit of remaining debt that I can pay off, every uh, every chance that uh, I get that it becomes feasible to get uh, an additional source of independence, like reduce replacing some form of energy input with uh, something off grid or uh, otherwise increasing uh, the productivity of my household in order to eliminate another need for an outside input is a, a further step in the same direction for me so I'm just uh, I'm doing what I can but I don't uh, I don't think I really deserve much credit for uh, trying to live my principles because there are a lot of uh, breaks that have gone my way that I can't take any credit for that have uh, enabled me to do it. Okay, that's understandable. Would you would you have any advice to, uh, you know, the young the younger anarchist generation of sort of what they can do to live, especially in the West? Well, you know, whenever it's feasible in, in your own community, make uh, contacts with other uh, people and find ways of meeting each other's needs uh, in, in ways that replace everyone's dependence on wage labor and on purchases from capitalist uh, enterprises. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have more uh income than you need for your immediate consumption needs. Do your best to retire debt, uh, avoid new debt, and uh, find ways of making your living situation more productive in order to reduce the need for outside income streams. Uh, generally, just uh, find ways to cooperate with other people to increase everyone's resilience and to build up the commons. Whereabouts can we, we purchase uh, the desktop regulatory state and, and your work? Do you have a central site or is it sort of anywhere and everywhere? Uh, you, can, you can find it at... Uh, you can find anything I've, I've written at Amazon, and I have a website called KevinACarson.org okay. that has that has um, PDFs of all my books as well. Are they are they free? Yeah, the the PDFs are free. They're uh, free facsimile versions. But if anybody has the uh, money to spare and would uh, like to have a, a hard card hard copy that they can dog ear and mark up and uh, save multiple places in and flip back and forth between them easily. Uh, they're all available on Amazon as well. Okay. Um, yeah, Kevin, unless there's anything you'd, you'd like to add, I think that seems to be a, a good place to finish up there. I can't think of anything, but it's uh, really been a fun conversation. Yeah, it's been great to meet you. Thanks very much. Thank you.